Hello, Jade. How are you? I'm really good. How are you? Not so bad. It's good that you can get jumping on a call with me today. Um, Thank you. It's nice to talk to you. Just for everybody else, I just want to introduce you. Um, Jade is an amazing, radiant nutritional therapist with a strong interest in gut and mental health support. Jade studied at the College of Naturopathic Medicine in London. And Jade uh, takes a multi-strand approach to health and well-being that um, begins primarily with nutrition and also takes into account a work-life balance and self-care. Um, Jade's dedicated to continuously furthering her knowledge within her field. And when based in London, Jade contributed to events with the top Harley Street fertility specialist who has impressive results with creating individual nutrition plans for IVF patients that were previously unsuccessful. That's amazing. Um, her business, Restore Nutrition, offers a wide range of services, including one-to-one -one consultations, corporate support and packages, menu planning, and overall nutrition and lifestyle support. Um, for a wide range of conditions, including allergies, intolerances, diabetes, thyroid issues, autoimmune conditions, and fertility, um, an array of women's issues, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and this includes achieving and maintaining weight loss or gain and improving sports nutrition. Like you do it the whole package. Yes, try, yeah. So um, that was a really good introduction. Thank you, Patrick. I do my best. <laughs> but I like to give people uh, a bit of an interest because we've spoke a number of times now. We've definitely had great conversations with you know, and I thought it would be a great idea to bring you on board with things that I'd be doing with people when they look for weight loss and that nutrition being a very important part of the weight loss process, usually it's a weight loss um, idea that um, people would see me with, but it's good to help know the nutrition side of it and aspect of it and what could actually, it could be something small, that a small shift that they could do maybe in the nutrition side of things can make a very big shift in their goal or aim of the shape size that they would like to um, get under. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, what we spoke about, like whenever we would chat about the the gut brain connection and how it all you know is so closely linked it's so important mm -hmm. and it's a relatively new well i think it's a very new thing and the on the lay people people on the ground are only starting to hear about the the brain gut connection but it's probably been something that's been studied and the the likes of neuros um and the what you on the work that you've been doing for like quite a few years now i would say um it has, it has been being researched, but I think not on the scale that what it is now. It's, it has still a really new field of research, and they're still finding out so many different things, and there's so many things they still don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's really evolving now at the minute. That's mad. Is there, um, could you just tell us why nutrition is so important? <laughs> why, why I study nutrition? Or, uh, well, why is nutrition important? Why should people pay attention to it? Um, so, basically, like, you need good nutrition for, like, your health and well-being. Your body is made up of, you know, scientifically made up of different chemicals and cells and enzymes. And your body needs specific nutrients, vitamins and minerals to actually carry out the processes that it needs to carry out for us just to stay in homeostasis which would be the ideal state of where we want our health and well-being to be but we need it for energy we need it for detoxification we need it for hormone production reproduction skin health digestive health like honestly the list just goes on and on but you know if you don't if you don't have the building box for that, it's, it just makes it nearly impossible for your body to carry out the processes that it needs to carry out. And um, I'd imagine then if if there's a great imbalance of maybe nutrients or a lack of any nutrients that are actually coming in, that it would have a great impact on those processes going on within the body, creating a wee bit of maybe the opposite of homeostasis pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Like probably being in a more acidic state, being inflamed. Um, like uh, yeah and the modern diet that people have now in this day and age with convenience foods takeaways ready meals like they all just contribute in a negative way to 
the homeostasis and the body. It's taken us further away from that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, actually. With uh, If you think on the processed foods and things to get, they're processed in such a way to keep them in, in the likes of, I'm thinking along the lines of preservatives. You know, the preservatives are there to preserve the food, but once the per we have to digest the preservatives and actually get rid of them, and that's probably adding to the work that the body needs to do, but adding maybe chemicals to it that maybe we don't really need. Yeah, like there's a there's a functional medicine doctor who I really like and follow a lot. Um, he's called Dr. Mark Hyman, and he's American, but he describes a lot a lot of the foods that people say are the foods as food like substances. So the ones that are pumped full, all the chemicals and stuff, we see them as food and naughty because that's what we've been taught and like shown them to be. But really. They're full of chemicals, preservatives, real food should rot, real food should come out of the ground. It should be, you know, animals that are brought up in an ethical way, like um, rather than being the packet that you can have in your cupboard that's going to last for five years and never go off because of the chemicals that's in it. You know, that that's fine for preserving it, as you say, on the shelf, but your gut doesn't want those preservatives whenever it's trying to digest things. That's actually, I've never heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense. Just that one term, you know, the food like substances. Yeah, I love it. Like, I, it's, it's, so, it hits the nail on the head, like, so well. Um, and they are food like substances, they're not actually food. Um, I can't remember what the name of the doctor was in America, but he, and his practice, he had an apple on his desk and a McDonald's on his desk. And after a month, the apple was rotted because the apple's food. The McDonald's was still the same. And then for a whole year, I think, the same McDonald's was on the desk. Never rotted, didn't change. Like, what? That's that's just plastic. Like, it's not real. Uh, I've seen that done with McDonald's before. And I've seen the likes of Pringles and things like that. They've been kept for like a few years. Um, I think there's actually a doctor has it. And the surgery almost like in a fish tank somewhere. It's like a glass cabinet in his actual waiting room. And yeah. all these different kind of foods, the McDonald's, the Pringles, um, different kind of foods. And they all look as good as um the day they were kind of bought. And then there's other foods that are food. Um and it's like we notes beside it, they say this was an apple, this was a banana, this was you know, that kind of way. Just to, to kind of give people a contrast. And I think uh, visual aid is very good, but that's a very good way of summing it up. Food, food like substances. That's I can remember that and actually use that. Uh, very good. But we were talking there about the the gut mind connection or the gut body connection. Um, do you want to tell us a wee bit more about that? Like I would have a good enough idea on it, but maybe for other people, it's never really heard about it. Um. Yeah. So, like a lot of the new, like. It's, it's obviously been a thing since humans have evolved, but um, it's being more apparent now and being shown the link between the gut and the brain. And like the gut is actually known as the second brain in the body anyway. Um, the gut and the brain are actually formed at the same time. Whenever, whenever an embryo is in the womb, whenever a baby's grown in the womb, they're made from the same cells. Um, and they're joined together um, by the um, vagus nerve, which is like um, the main communication line between the gut and the brain. But the nerves from the nervous system are so closely entwined and hardwired under the gut. That's why our, you know, emotional health and um, is also closely linked to the gut. And actually, like if you look at the different neurotransmitters that we produce and hormones. Um, they actually, the, the happy hormone or, you know, happy hormone serotonin that people know a lot about, um, people think that these are, these are made in the brain because there are the chemicals that, you know, make us feel happy, but 90% of the serotonin is actually produced in the gut. So if you've got an inflamed, unhappy gut that is bloated and you've got wind and flatulence problems, problems with constipation, diarrhea, this means that you're having problems absorbing the vitamins and minerals that you need that are needed to produce these hormones to get them up to the brain. So then we know that we're actually going to be happy or, you know, or we need to have a fight or flight response. Um, uh, so 
if your gut isn't working properly, it's not allowing your brain to work properly either. Um, so it's that's why it's so important to make sure. Like, and I would say that eighty percent of clients that I see through having been at college through a student clinic and now in the clinics that I have since I've qualified, eighty percent of people have got some sort of dysbiosis, some sort of gut problem that is affecting their overall health and well-being, which is also contributing to stress levels as well. And that's the stress has been in this western part of the world. It's one of the biggest. Um, you know, everybody that I typically that you would see or speak that once they if they go off work on the sick, it's typically called an SRA. They get a stress related illness, and um, so obviously there must be a great connection with even dietary wise what can be done to actually help um, de stress the body as well. Um, you talked a lot the last time we were chatting. We were talking a lot about um, inflammation in certain parts of the body. Um, yeah. And, is there certain foods that maybe can aggravate it, and is there certain foods in that could maybe take it away? Um, I so like inflammation. What I will say is that like I that disease is disease, just d i s dash e a s e disease in your body of any part, and I um believe that all disease comes from some sort of inflammation in the body, whether that be a uh, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular, digestive, it's all coming from inflammation and in the cells and that part of the body. Um, so like going back to what we talked about, the, the modern world that we live in, um, your uh, processed foods are all full of a substance called omega-6, which um, we eat way too much of than the recommended um, daily allowance that we should have. Omega-6 is like the flip side of omega-3. If you've heard of omega-3, omega-3 fish oils, we get that in our oily fish, nuts and seeds, avocados, um, extra virgin olive oil. So um, in ratio, we need omega-3 and omega-6 um, in our diet. Um, but um, yeah, because basically they're both, um, we can't produce them in the body. We need to get them through diet. So we do need to get them through food sources. But our ratio, we should be eating a ratio of one omega-3 to six. One omega-3 to four omega-6 a day. That's what the recommended, you know, proportion of what we should have as um, guidelines have said that people are actually consuming one omega-3 to 20 omega-6. So people are eating five times as much omega-6 as what they should be having. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. So that um, contributes to um, reducing inflammation in the body. Whereas omega-6 is pro-inflammatory, which contributes to inflammation in the body, which contributes to all your different diseases. So that's your, um, your lower grade vegetable oils, your crisps, your ready meals, your takeaways, all that. That's your omega-6. But also as well as the and like and then you've got your refined sugar, you've got um, cigarettes, alcohol, um, like eating like meat um, and animal products. I've got a well, not not fish, but um, meat and eggs. I've got a substance in them called arachidonic acid, which if eaten in excess and over the amount that we need, um, also produces inflammation. So. That's why I try and like as well make people mindful of you, know, you don't have to have meat with every meal or an animal like source of protein. You know, having maybe one meat free day, one meat free meal a day, or um, you know, even day a week. It all it all contributes to reducing inflammation as well in the body. I remember whenever we were first chatting, you gave me a very interesting thing that I didn't. I didn't actually know it was around the World Health Organization and made meat. It was an interesting thing that you told me, and that I was kind yeah, of that's, going ahead. Um, yeah, so the World Health Organization have listed um, cured ham, sliced hams, and like preserved meats as a grade one carcinogen, carcinogen being a cancer causing substance. And other grade one carcinogens are tobacco, smoke, and asbestos. And the, I think that's scary. Like, honestly, I think that you go out and if you go to buy a pack of cigarettes, there's a health warning on it that says 
this can cause cancer, this can cause death, this can cause infertility, whatever you don't go to the, the fridge section in a, in a supermarket and it doesn't say this has been shown to cause colorectal cancer because I'm sure people wouldn't eat it and buy it as much if they actually knew the health risks around it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it really, it made a very good impression on me once she told me that, and I was kind of glad. Like over the past few months, I've been swapping out. But just as you said, it was a great way that you said it there. If you had one day a week where you didn't have meat, where now I'm at the stage now where it might be one day in a week that I might have meat. Yeah. Anyway, and that's how it's, it's, gradual, right. it's a gradual change, and I don't think it's like you need to go full on vegan like overnight. I think the more gradual you do it, the more you stick to it. And you find out what works for you. But I think if I had heard that sooner, or knew that maybe a bit sooner, I think it would have pushed me a bit quicker to move towards a more, you know, less of the red meat kind of thing. You know, and I've actually started eating fishes and things like that now, and I actually love a salmon and things like that. Um, but I was wondering, is there a, like a, a one size all approach or a very quick fix that people can use, or is it, as you say, just a gradual process? <laughs> Um, I definitely don't believe in a one size fits all. That's like the opposite of what what I I believe and what I've been taught. Like I believe every single person um, is unique. No two clients that come to me will get the same plan. Um, there's no like here's diabetes patient one, diabetes diabetes patient two. There's the diabetes plan. It's we look at your medical history. We look at your family history. We look at your diet, what you're eating, what you're reacting to, what your allergies and intolerances are. Like, I just, that's the best way to treat, you know, any condition um, from the inside out. Um, and I don't, like, I I really don't believe in foods being free foods and, you know, like these diets that tell people they can eat processed foods, like, until they're coming out of their ears, like, that's, you know, you can't eat super noodles all day long and they're not, yeah, you might not put on weight, but it's the the, the damage that it's doing to you, your body internally. But yeah, I, I just think everybody's different. And one thing that suits one person will not suit another person because we're all made up genetically different. So. And just even part of that process, you know, as you mentioned there, when people come to see you, you're taking a very good intake on their past history, their medical history. Um, and different things to get. So would you, as well as you're trying to get to know your client, how well um, or how important do you think it is that the client themselves begin to develop a relationship with themselves and spend time to get to know themselves and their, their own mind and their own body's needs? Yeah, I think like so much people just eat to eat and they don't really take into account what they're eating, you know, and how it's affecting their body. Like if you listen to your body close enough it's going to give you the answers it, that it's that's the best source of knowledge but it's just what I do is kind of extract that knowledge from the person but like if, if people have got symptoms like just think about what you're eating whenever you're having the symptoms and when they're aggravated um, and I also think that when people start taking you know notice of what they're eating it improves their overall health and well-being not just physically but mentally as well because they're actually looking after themselves it goes back to that thing of you know it's like self-care but also you're allowing your body to work optimally and you're able to produce those neurotransmitters and those hormones so it's like it's a full circle so yeah I think like and I'll say to every everybody that everybody is different and some people might be able to implement a really strict you know um, change in a diet um, overnight but some people might need to do baby steps and um, Rome was involved in a day some people it will just be not drinking enough water they're not be moving on they you know taking away the processed foods or it's, it's just different for every person so when it comes to people maybe exploring themselves or paying more attention to how they what they're eating and getting to know themselves a wee bit better and what their bodies actually is kind of asking them they, they maybe eat. Is there any exercises or ideas that you find that helps clients to, to do that? Um, I, so, um, like I said, just keeping a note, like 
being aware of your symptoms. Keeping a food diary is like the best thing I think that people can do. Um, it's making you think about everything that you're putting in your mouth and, you know, what what is causing any flare-ups or issues. And sometimes people, I think, just eat mindlessly and don't even um, realise what they're eating on a daily basis. Um, for these, say for people that are eating kind of mindlessly or whatever, if they're journaling or bringing in a, like a dietary plan, like how important would it be that they just be brutally honest with what they've actually ate and actually put it down? You know, have you found it with maybe people that you've worked with that they've actually, just by seeing, oh my God, I've actually had X, Y, Z this week. Um, and otherwise, if they didn't keep track of it, they wouldn't have actually really. So it must be, very, you know, do you see the, the impact that that has on people? Yeah, definitely. Um, like, um, I think writing things down makes it more realistic and some people just might reach for those extra biscuits and not really, you know, think much of it. But when they're having to take a note of what it is they're eating, then, you know, they might be going, oh, maybe I might not grab them because I'm going to have to write it down if I do. Um, I don't think, like, people, you know, on the state, on the other side of the spectrum, I, I think, like, keeping a food diary for a period of, you know, two weeks or a week or something, but not doing it, you know, always constantly because you don't want people to go the other way and be too overconscious of everything they're eating. Like, I believe that when people are eating the right stuff, when you're eating more plants, um, you know, less anti-inflammatory food, less processed foods, you really shouldn't have to monitor your portion sizes and what you're eating all the time because you're not eating the crap and your body's not reacting in an inflammatory way. And also what people who might be mindlessly, I think that the likes of going to see somebody like you with hypnotherapy or counseling or CBT, because it has a mind, body and approach. And I can give them the nutrition advice, um, but I'm not with them every day in their kitchen. I'm not with them. They stop them, you know, the, the thought processes that trigger them off for the emotional eating. It's the same as people giving up cigarettes or alcohol or any addiction or anything like that. It is an addiction and food can be the same, but it's harder with food because um, you have to eat. You don't have to drink alcohol and you don't have to smoke or take drugs, but you have to eat every day. So it's about finding a healthy balance with that. Um. I suppose even what we're touching on now, I think even the point of this call at the moment is actually in some ways to help us educating people and giving kind of important kind of ideas and concepts. So do you feel that um, education around food for society in general would be a good idea or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's really important because I think that if people are more aware of the effects it nutrition and diet has on health and well-being in general and you know just that link between illness and like using food as medicine well I like I think having a preventative um a, a preventative approach to um health and well-being rather than a reactive approach which we have now if people were more aware that if they were looking after themselves with good diet and nutrition it could help to prevent different illnesses and diseases. Like going back to joining when children are at school and just in general, everybody, I find that whenever I do group workshops and information talks, um, people just aren't really aware of the power of um, what diet can help with and, and, and do for them, you know, for their health and overall well-being. Like I even... I think I heard it somewhere before. I think it was like an indigenous native kind of tribe kind of background that there's a belief that innately in their, like in their condition of, of how they view the world, you know, that anything that you consume, whether, you know, it's either for either for a cure or it's a poison. So essentially it works for you or against you. Um, so do you, would you see maybe nutrition as a, as a natural form of a medicine? Definitely. Um, like, like I said, you know, obviously, even with medicines that you can have, some can work for people, some can't. Like, if you look at, like, diet and nutrition, 
um, like your processed foods or your, you know, your malnourishment um, causing disease and illness. And then you've got your anti-inflammatory, your omega-3s. You've got, um, you know, um, your green leafy vegetables, which are like the holy grail of um, nutrition. They're full of all your vitamins and minerals. Um, they're detoxifying. And you've got like, you know, your oily fishes. You've got your complex carbs that help to manage blood sugar levels. And even some foods are, you know, like antibacterial and um, antibiotic some supplements and yeah so like obviously obviously supplement forms of um nutrition can be used as well so yeah I 100 percent believe but you know obviously there's a, a time and a place for conventional medicine and it is needed for a lot of things but on the flip side like I heard this really scary statistic um which actually blew me away when I heard it about the amount of money that the NHS in Northern Ireland spend treating type 2 diabetes a day, which was one million pound a day in Northern Ireland for a disease that's totally treatable with diet and lifestyle change. Wow. And then, you know, the, the, the healthcare system's at a point where they, they're struggling with demand and then you've got your cardiovascular diseases, you've got um, IBS disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, they're all they're all driven by diet, diet and lifestyle. Um, obviously there's a genetic factor to some um, illnesses, but um, it's it's just scary. And I just think that if you look at a, like a GP or a medical doctor, they do five years of medical training, they get 10 hours of nutrition training and that five years. So they're not equipped to provide the information and it's not their fault. They train in pharmaceuticals. They know what drugs will work for what condition or illness, but they, they don't know about diet unless they go in and look um, look at it themselves. And there's a really um, interesting doctor in England called Dr. Chatterjee and he's a GP and he was the same. He kind of, he's now following like a bit of a functional medicine approach. He went and studied nutrition and stuff but he said more and more now GPs are speaking up and saying you know what are we supposed to do like that they, they're finding their like resources are limited because of the fact that they don't get that training and Dr Chatterjee he's got a quite a big following around him now he did a couple of programs with BBC I think it was Channel 4 as well he was on a documentary for as well and it's amazing to hear from his side of the that side of the veil maybe one way they put it um, just the struggles that they have, you know, they're doing their best they can, but at the same, at the end of the day, they might not just be as equipped as what people might expect them to be. Do you know that kind of way? I think people go up yeah. with perceived ideas that the doctor knows all the answers. Where, and truth is, they they're, they're they're trained in a certain way, um, for a certain kind of outcome, and it is towards like the pharmaceutical side of things because somebody needs to know about that because they are yeah. you know, there is a time and a place for them, um. But tell me that's why I think that they should that's why I think that they there should be more of a you know an integrative approach with holistic and complementary therapies, like including like nutrition, even like you know, like hypnotherapy, um, homeopathy, all those types of things with the NHS. And there is a thing now called social prescribing, which right. is the GP is um working with like different healthy living centers and groups and they can say you know they can like refer a patient to them groups who then can speak to the patient and say right well you're having issues with your gut and irritable bowel disease we've got this nutritional therapist in your area that can help or somebody's got a mental health problem they might go and see a cbt counselor or a hypnotherapist it's so I think it should be more like that. It should be working together as a whole rather than them and us kind of thing. Yes, that's a good way to put it, actually. So tell me, what would typically lead somebody to come and find uh, a nutritionist like yourself? The, the, the hard thing about it is, and I think with the NHS is a great system that has you know saved so many lives, um, but people are used to the fact that they go to the NHS and it's free. 
So some people might not, and this is this is in the UK really, maybe Northern Ireland, um, but people might not be as open to paying for services until they get to a point where they've exhausted what they've done with the NHS. They haven't got any issue, any answers to what their issues are. So then they end up going down the holistic route. And I find that all too common to what I see. People have kind of at the last chance saloon. And like I've had people come to me who have thought, they've had every test under the sun and they've thought, I've got an autoimmune condition or I've got some sort of chronic condition. Um, and all, and then in all honesty, what they were reacting to was the food that they were eating. And whenever they changed it, they couldn't believe it, like the, the difference. And this is in a period of between four and six weeks. You know, it's not a, it's an elimination diet might be needed, but you know, it's, yeah. So it's putting on a wee bit of work in the short term to get a long term kind of like the like essentially my idea or my idea, idea around it would be you know that somebody's really then at a point that they're willing to invest in themselves to get themselves kind of maybe straightened out, and that that short investment in the short term will actually is actually a lifetime investment because once they sort of get educated and know about it and take the actions and sort of get over them kind of hurdles you know it's something that. It'll be, it's kind of like walking, you know, nobody just got up and walked when they were a child, you know, they had to fall down a few times and then get up and go. But another thing I would hear from people, and it's something I had myself at one time, was uh, maybe an objection or a belief that people would have that, you know, the idea is that healthier food is far more expensive or it's far more time consuming to make. But what's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I don't agree with that because, um, like one thing that I've done is like, I've gone and looked in supermarkets if things are available and stuff. Like if you take little, um, they've got amazing, um, fresh fruit and vegetables. They've now introduced any, a really good organic range. Um, I had like in one workshop I was doing a guy, I was like, right, I've got a pound a day for a ready meal. And I said, right, fine. So I have done a shopping list for little on things that you can get. You can get a bag of whole wheat pasta for 45p. The passata is like 25, 30p. You can get a courgette for like 40p, right? So you make that whole bag of pasta, the tomatoes, a bit of oil, like seasoning. It's going to cost you two pounds to make that. That's going to feed you for three days. Like there's ways and means around it. And it's just about putting in that bit of prep time and, you know, not, um, not just wanting to go for the convenience option because it's not it's not the healthy one. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, uh, there was something else we were chatting about another time, like we were chatting a couple of weeks about, ago when you were actually telling me about oat milk and I was saying if I was looking to try different milks and how oat milk won't actually go kind of clotty on your tea or go lumpy. Um, but it was something else you'd say sort of in the same conversation was the going to that, uh, the, the healthy aisle or the free from aisle in some of the supermarkets. Now, this actually happened to me last night. Um, me and Claire were in Asda. And I was over getting the milk from one corner of the shop where they have the rice milk. I have oat milk. And there's another kind of almond milk I have on there at the moment. And I want to try all three just to see which one kind of floats my boat. Um, um, Claire was looking for something and she went over to the, the free from aisle. I think it was wraps and something else and i noticed the same milk was on the same aisle but it was nearly twice as expensive just another really? i it was some form of al almond milk and almond milk over beside where the milk is where the the bakery end of things where they have the the fresh cream kind of goods and then they had the milk the long life milk and over there it was like 165 and it was 345 on the fee the, the thing was, was it the same brand it was a slightly different brand, but it was the same kind of milk. Right. You know, all the all the brands are different, and it's just about trying what ones what one you like the best. Um, and I always tell people when they're going for like dairy free alternatives for milk, go for the unsweetened version because the ones that are are sweetened are just full of sugar as well. So just watching out for that. Brood Health is a really good brand, um, and so is Plenish. Plenish is a bit more expensive than Rude Health, but like you can get the one Rude Health for like 160 or 180 or something in Sainsbury's. The almond milk that is. Very good. There's um 
what I call it. Even when it comes to ideas for making sort of meals and making them last longer and actually how quick some of them are. Like I had a, I was on your Instagram in there quite a few times now for inspiration, what am I going to eat? Mm-hmm. And you have some really quick and easy, very, very, very simple things to put together. And most of the stuff that people would have in their cupboards anyway, you actually make things. It's unbelievable. See, once you have your cupboard, like your pantry per se, stocked by the things that are quick and easy to make, like even the likes of making a big pot of quinoa on a Sunday evening, um, and then just keeping it for the next few days, just chuck it on, chuck it on a pot with some vegetables and different flavorings each day, or you know, steaming some veg and sticking it along with it. Like it has, it's, and you can stick a bit of fish in the oven, or you know, like. It's just mixing and matching. And I think once you have the stuff in your cupboard, it's a lot easier to, to kind of make the things. I think that's, that, that's something I noticed now whenever I sort of swapped out the meat once a week for something else. And slowly over time, that, as you say, that cupboard then with a new herb or a new spice or a new kind of thing. And then once it, once it's kind of there, it's very easy then to draw on it. Um, but for anybody starting out, maybe beginning to take into consideration their diet or any other nutritional aspects in their life, um, whether it's for health reasons or otherwise, you know, what would you recommend would be a good starting point? Water, like monitoring your water intake and making sure you're drinking enough, like what you're doing right now. Um, and uh, eat more plants. Like I just think you cannot eat enough plants. Like your plate should be half plant source. Um, then your next biggest portion should be your grains. Um, you know your good quality quinoa brown rice. Also, sw- switching from white grains to whole grains. Um, just get rid of the white um, processed grains, bread, pasta, rice. Um, they've got the fiber stripped out of them. Like the goodness isn't even in there. Um, they just spike your blood sugar levels. Um, and um, so, eat more plants. Um, have a couple of meat free days um and yeah just like cut out the processed foods really like that's that's an excellent starting point um having three um portions of oily fish a week that's your your salmon mackerel anchovy sardines and herrings are the best source um even like white fish has not high in omega-3 but like even swapping out that as well for red meat or you know it's and also processed meats like I said they're they're just full of nitrates and sulfates and nasty chemicals and and uh, food like substances I love the way that I think, I think yeah. the biggest takeaway from this conversation for me is if I look at food now and say well is that food or is that food like and I'll just you know just based on that you you know you know well this is the one they go for um, yeah. Something I seen next to him on your post at, on, I think it was Instagram as well, or was it Facebook? But I think it sums up the process, as you say, very, very well, and forming a new habit or relationships with their diet or food on path of wellness. You know, it is a slow process, but quitting won't speed it up. Yeah. I just, you know, I could high five you for how good that was. It was when I seen that, I was like, hey, well, that's actually true. That's a true friendly thing in life, but yeah. when it comes to diet, that's, you know. I like if you have a bad day, it doesn't mean you're off the bandwagon and just get back on it again. Do you know what I mean? Like, and not having the convenience crab foods at home, you're not going to be able to reach for them. Uh, what is it? You'll know this better than me. 21 days they form a new habit. I, so 21 I, have, I have a counter argument that it's just how bad do you want it? Uh, well, not- like it's like that, but yeah, like quitting doesn't. You know, just get back on the horse again and keep going. Like, and, and it's a lot. It's a it's lifestyle changes. It's not a quick fix pill that you're gonna you know lose weight in a month or like you know it's about making lifestyle changes that you can sustain. Like I don't know, people have asked me about like diet and clubs and stuff like that, and I just my response is, how many people do you know that are at these diet programs for their whole life? They lose the weight, then they put it on, then they go back, then they lose it again, then they put it on. Like, that's just not good for your body. It's stressful. You're eating foods that aren't good for your body anyway. It's about making the changes 
that you will be able to keep up for a lifetime that you can pass on to your family and you know pass on to other people to improve their health and well-being rather than just making making yourself miserable trying to follow a diet all the time like Mm. So, you know, even that, that when it comes to forming habits, like I know I said the you know how bad do you want it. There's another way I would look at it and I, I know I was talking to you, but it's just something I find with people it helps us reframing the word no. Because some people say, Well, if I say no to that, I'm denying myself something. So I would look at no now completely different. And when I explain it to people, they kinda get it and it makes it a lot easier for them to form that new habit. And that's the idea that, you know, if you say no, you're actually saying yes. But if you know what you're saying yes to, then that's the, it makes it a lot easier. I was on one of the shops a couple of weeks ago and me and Claire, since we were going out, we would always love the Terry's chocolate orange. And I was on the pound shop and I seen the Terry's chocolate orange and I lifted it out of habit pretty much and lifted it off the shelf and I had it in my hand like this. And I must have walked 10 strides with my hand out like that because in my head I was kind of going, am I saying Am I, if I say no to this, I'm actually saying yes to what I'm actually looking for shooting forward. And I literally, I kid you not, if anybody was watching me, I was kind of going to guess them, but the time I got to the end of the aisle and I realised, no, this I actually don't want this because I want to say yes to what I'm looking for. Then I just kind of dropped it at the end of the shelf and walked on. But it's it's a good starting point, I think, for people when they're looking to make a change. It's like, look at, if you make a, your no a yes and know what your yes is, then it makes the habit a lot easier to change. But that's um, yeah. there. Um, so I've been very fortunate. People have heard um, that we were going to have a conversation today. So we've had a couple of questions um, submitted. Um, one person's asked me, as a diabetic, um, I eat four pieces of fruit daily as a healthy snack, uh, along with my sandwiches. But I was told due to the sugar content to cut back to two a day. Uh, however, this leaves me hungry. And when I'm working, and as I'm not on as much more than the minimum wage, um, what would you recommend for a viable cost-effective alternative to curb the hunger pains? Um, one thing I'll say with them, with diabetes, just be mindful they have low sugar fruits, like your berries, um, even oranges and kiwis, rather than kind of, you know, strawberries and bananas and stuff like that, which are higher for sugar. So that's for the fruit, but nuts and seeds are an amazing snack. Um, they're full of protein and um, healthy fats, and they're really sat- they, they satisfy hunger um, uh, very well. Um, even um, ensuring that they're drinking enough water as well. Um, and between meals, making sure they get there between their eight and ten glasses a day is important, which will also help with hunger pangs. And carrot sticks. And hummus are a great snack as well. Obviously, just being mindful of the kind of amounts that you're having. But um, yeah, I would say um, that would be the best options for you know keeping hunger at bay. And berries is actually quite good for as a snacking kind of thing. There's very little prep on them. Just wash them and dry them down. And yeah, mm-hmm. blueberries are amazing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even think that certain fruits had maybe a higher or lower sugar content either. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, what I called there was a lady's asked um, for dietary advice on what foods to eat or avoid to help with, I can't even pronounce it, endometritis, or is it? Endometriosis. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so with endometriosis, it can be a lot of, it's a lot of inflammation and the kind of reproductive system of a lady. So, um, avoiding um, inflammatory foods, so like processed foods, cutting down on them, um, cutting down on red meat, um, dairy products as well, maybe swapping out for some um, nice uh, dairy free alternative milks and stuff, um, and just often like anti inflammatory foods like um, ginger, turmeric, um, lemon. Uh, like your green leafy vegetables as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to kind of get down the inflammatory side of things. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, what I called, you're a wealth of information and I appreciate having your time today with you. Um, but if somebody was to look out for a wee bit more information or to find out maybe more of these uh, lovely recipes and things to get you, have, where would be the best way to reach out to you or get in touch or find these recipes and things to get? 
Um, so I've got my Instagram page, um, which is made by Jade underscore nutrition. Um, I post everything on that, everything that I post on Instagram. I also put on my Facebook page, which is Restore Nutrition made by Jade. Um, I put like some different articles and stuff on the Facebook page as well. Um, email um, info at restorenutrition.co.uk. And I've got my website, www.restorenutrition.co.uk. Um, any channel, I'm always, you know, checking up on them. So anyway, somebody wants to contact me, there's a contact me button through my website. So um, it goes straight through to my email as well. Oh, very good. Um, Jade, thank you very, very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I think there's a lot of takeaways um, for, and anybody watching this again or listening back to it. I think there's a great amount of uh, great things or nuggets there. So thanks very much for your time and giving us that information today, Jade. Thank you. Thanks for the interesting chat. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Tell me something interesting. Have you a fun fact that you could tell me about yourself? About me? Um, a fun fact. So um, th this might qualify as a fun fact, but yeah, I've recently just taken off doing martial arts this year. Um, I've started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is at the start was really out of my comfort zone, but I'm loving it now. So yeah. Stay out of your way then. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get me in a bad mood. <laughs> very good. Well, we'll just end it now on that note. Um, but again, thanks very much for your time. And if people know how to reach out. I'll add the all the links at the bottom of any of these videos that go out. So the, the links will be there for people to use. But uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good day. And you, dear.